Evening, everybody. Bright up here. Um, thanks, John, for the gracious words. Uh, I might jump into your arms later when I'm done because I've been here for five days and I'm exhausted, quite frankly. <laughs> but um, it is a joy and an honor to be with all of you and to be with the bishop and be with a bunch of my brothers uh, in the clergy. And uh, I just want to tell you how grateful I am personally for the uh, the reception that I've received and one of my team members for, this is the initiative that we're a part of right now, it's called Acts 29 and we usually travel in, uh, in groups. Uh, there's only five of us on this team. We're kind of itinerant missionaries that go around the country working with um, pastors and their teams to try to help us uh, reclaim parishes, missionary identities. And so um, I just want to wave to Mary. So she's sitting in the front row next to Joe and Leslie Teeling. So Mary and I have just been overwhelmed by the reception that we've received. We love Des Moines. Like, and I especially love being here because Michigan played Iowa last night and we played Iowa State two weeks ago. And I'm going home with two W's, so I don't really care. <laughs> but if I was going to be honest, I should have put Utfidim up there, too. I, I really want to thank Addie and, um, and Brett and all those who've been deeply involved in bringing this ministry to, uh, not only to Dowling, but it's, uh, it's making its way up to my way in the country in, in Michigan as well. So I should have put that up there, and I should have put um, Iowa Catholic Radio. I, I, I can't thank uh, all of you enough. We, we have sensed... Um, it, and this is important, I think, just to hear from somebody who comes from an outside perspective. Sometimes when you live in the middle of something, you get used to it. Uh, I hope you all recognize and, and can feel what we feel uh, by visiting you, uh, which is God is doing an extraordinary thing here in Des Moines. I mean that. We have met so many great people, laymen and women, clergy, people who are on fire with the gospel. Some of you have been praying fervently for years and for decades. Um, God is, I, I, my, my sense is God is establishing a beachhead here. I think He's doing this in different parts of the country. We have the opportunity because of the work that we're doing right now to travel um, all the time, actually. And this is one of the places where we see God doing something really extraordinary. Um, I want to encourage you to thank Him for that, to act on that and to thank him in advance for what he's going to do. So expect great things here. Brothers, I'm praying for you uh, in a most particular way, just that God will continue to give you all the courage that we need right now in these days that we're living so as to shepherd God's people. Um, and I want to just thank all of you for the, the hospitality that we've gotten. Here's the truth, though. This is what God wants. God wants Des Moines back. And I mean that. All of this is rightfully his. All of this is rightfully His, and He wants it back. And that will happen through you, through all of you, and so many more who aren't here tonight, but who will be perhaps next year. As I've been praying about what it is that we just all watched and what it is that the Lord might want me to do tonight to augment what we saw on screen and video, and thanks, brothers, for what you, you guys do and spirit juice and what you put together here. Here's what I would suggest. I, th I think what God wants me to do is something like, I think this is what preaching does. Preaching is supposed to remove the veil. That's what the proclamation of the gospel is supposed to do, remove the veil. As we do that, which doesn't have anything to do with the messenger of the gospel. It has to do with the power of the gospel. It opens our eyes to new things. So I'm going to try tonight to do this. No, I'm not going to do that. Isn't that cute? I'll tell you what I'm going to do in a minute. So, so here we are in Advent, second weekend or second Sunday. Who knows what to do during Advent? Don't raise your hand, but everybody knows what to do during Lent, or at least we seemingly do. Most people don't have any idea what to do during Advent. Shop. <laughs> Decorate the tree. Have a party. Have another party. Just don't have a party at the hotel where I'm staying because they got into it last night. and It was really ugly. <laughs> but I think it's really significant. I think it's actually providential that this event's happening right now, that this movie was just played right now, and that I'm talking tonight during Advent, because I think God wants to help us to understand in a new way what it is that Advent's all about. 
I've been ordained 23 years now, and I can tell you that I've learned more, I think, in the last two years about why it is the Lord has come and what it is He's come to do than I've ever known in my life. If I asked you that question, or if the person that you were going to meet in a store or in your neighborhood or at school or at work asked you that question, would you be able to give an answer? Why is He there? What is this season that we're in right now all about? What is it that we are preparing to celebrate at Christmas? What is the big deal? Why did God come? I don't think my experience is most Christians and most Catholics have what I think is supposed to be the immediate answer to that question. That's what I want to talk about tonight. Because if we get that, then we'll understand what's happening in the Mass and why it is that the Eucharist is so deserving of our devotion and our love and our worship. But if we don't get that, we won't know anything. That's why it's so easy to miss Mass or to think it's boring because we don't know what it is that Jesus is doing there. So here's what I want to try to do tonight. I want to talk about, I want to do three things. I want to talk about why He came, what does He want from you and from me, and how do we do that? In other words, I want to talk about, as I try to preach some aspect of the gospel, I want to try to open our eyes, or I, I want to ask the Holy Spirit to, to open our eyes, to remove the veil so that we might gain new insights into what it is that Jesus has accomplished for us and why the only logical, intelligible, reasonable thing to do with our lives once we've come to know that is to surrender to Him. But then I also want to talk about what it is that you and I can do in our lives to help others see more clearly so that the veil is removed for them. Because it's the lay vocation, it's you who know who doesn't come to church, right? You're the ones who know, the people who don't know the Lord. We're trying to take care of the people who are in the church. And so the more that you can in your extraordinary vocation as laymen and women be able to explain to other people who it is you've met and what it is He's done, and the more that you can embark on the vocation that is uniquely yours, namely that of transforming the world, to bring it more into harmony with the plan that God originally intended for it, the more the veil is removed and the more our churches will be packed. I came across this quote not too long ago, a woman I'm really fond of. She's a retired Anglican priest. If you'd told me when I was a young priest that my favorite author was going to be a retired woman, Anglican priest, I would have said, you're out of your mind, but it's Jesus work. Thank you. So Fleming Rutledge writes this, in the final analysis, specialized theological knowledge can take us only so far. We need to know the story. I would say this is especially true with us in the Eucharist. It doesn't do any good, I don't think, if we are able to parse and explain transubstantiation and all the different details about the Eucharist if I can't explain to you and if it hasn't happened to me that I know the story. My experience at Mass, oftentimes, as I look out on people's faces, it's as if I, I, I'm looking at people who woke up in the middle of chapter 83 of a book. And they're just lost. That, that was me for much of my life when I was up until 25 or so. I had no idea what was going on. I knew something was happening, but I didn't know what was happening. And no one was explaining it to me. So what's the story? The story, I think, is synthesized in what it is that St. Paul says here in his letter to the Romans, the gospel is power. That's the story. The story is the gospel, or the gospel is the story, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's not what he means there. The gospel, 
the proclamation of the good news, it's power. That's what I'm going to try to do tonight by God's Holy Spirit. That's what these brothers and these brothers try to do every day when they preach. We try to proclaim the gospel. And note that Paul doesn't say the messenger of the gospel is power. The messenger of the gospel is irrelevant. It doesn't matter if you can preach like the bishop or like any other person that you might admire. Don't worry about that. Just deliver the news because the gospel itself, what it is that God has done for us, changes lives. The word Paul uses for power is dynamite. That's the Greek word. It's explosive news. That's hence the title, the extraordinary news of the gospel. But I don't think most people experience the story as explosive. I don't think they experience it as extraordinary. I think they experience it as boring. And that's tragic. Here's what John Paul II said once. He says, the result of the proclamation of the gospel is supposed to be that a person is gradually overwhelmed to the point that they entrust themselves, they surrender themselves to Jesus in faith. It would be interesting to ask my brothers, if you were to ask that question tomorrow at Mass of the people who are sitting in the congregation, let's just do a show of hands. How many people here have been overwhelmed by the gospel and have surrendered everything to Jesus? I don't think we'd get many hands. I actually would argue that we, we preach parts of the gospel all the time. I don't think we hear the gospel in the church in the way that we should. I've become increasingly convinced that just like in every other um, class surrounding, if you will, so at, at Dowling, huh, what do you do at the beginning of at least freshman year huh, for, the, for the guys who are coming in and the girls coming in? The beginning of the year, what do you do? You review. I would argue that every year, at least once, maybe it's September, maybe it's Advent, maybe it's January, at least once, you spend four weeks and all you do is you tell the story. Because the challenge for us as Catholics, if you're Catholic, is that lectionary, which is a great gift on one hand, if you know the Bible. How many people know the Bible? How many people know the story? And so you're left with three readings, our task is to try to find a way to synthesize into, these, into something that's not too long, kind of funny, gives you something concrete to do. That's not what the Word of God's supposed to do in my life. It's supposed to change my life. Please, God, He will overwhelm us tonight. I've become so convinced of this that every time, you know, people come to priests, and they usually don't come to us and go, you know, Father, my life is so good right now. I just had to tell somebody that. <laughs> that isn't what we hear, right? So we're trauma doctors, that's what we are, which traumatizes us, by the way. That's why you need to pray for them. So usually now, someone will come to me, and they'll say whatever it is that's brought them to me, which is some sort of mishap that's going on in their life, and every single time, I'll do the same thing. I, I have to use these now. So I'll say, you know what? That's an awesome question. Before I answer the question, can I explain to you how I see, like how I see the world, or actually how Scripture sees the world, how it sees reality? Because if you don't get this, nothing I'm about to say to you is going to make sense. And if they say no, then we're done with the conversation. I got free hour. If they say yes, then I explain it to them. I can do it in five minutes. I can do it in six weeks. This is what I always begin RCIA with. But a year ago or so, I had a young woman in my uh, office. Actually, we were meeting in the chapel in the church. She was 25 years old. She was drop-dead gorgeous. She was extremely successful. She made a boatload of money. Her life was a disaster. And she asked me the question that she asked me, and I asked her, can I tell you how I see the world? She says, yeah. I got done. This is what she said to me. 
as she's bawling her eyes out. And she says, why have I never heard this? She was overwhelmed, not by the messenger, by the message. The veil got removed for her. So what's the gospel? What's the message? What's the story? Technically, this is the word that we use for it in Greek, kerygma. It's not exactly a word that rolls off your tongue. It doesn't matter if you know it or not. It's the Greek word that means proclamation. When Paul says the gospel is power, this is in essence what he means, the kerygma, the proclamation of the gospel, the story that you and I hopefully have been overwhelmed by, but maybe not, but what you and I are entrusted with overwhelming others with in the opportunities that we have to share the story with them. What's the kerygma? It's classically broken down into four parts. These are the parts. The goodness of creation, sin and its consequences, God's response to our sin, and our response to what God has done for us. That doesn't overwhelm me. I don't know about you. I try to ask it or, or another way to think about it, by asking four questions, which are all huge questions, by the way. The first question is, why is there anything rather than nothing? Like, why do you exist? Why are there pandas? Greatest animal on earth, by the way. Why are there planets? Why are there, why are there nebula? Why are there oceans? Why are there animals in the ocean that you'll never see? Why does anything exist? Second question, why is everything so obviously messed up? Maybe you've noticed that. Third question, what, if anything, has God done about it? And the fourth question, if He has done anything about it, how should I respond? That's still a lot to remember for most of us. So the way I've learned to do this, so that I can tell the story quickly to people and so that I can pray with the story and ask the Lord to overwhelm me, is I break it up into four words. Created, captured, rescued, and response. That's the gospel to me. Created, captured, rescued, and response. When I hear this, whether it's through praying with Scripture, whether it's through I hear it in a, a talk from a layman or woman, when I hear it from a, an ordained priest or deacon, when I hear it, the result is I am overwhelmed. And I got overwhelmed. I mentioned Fleming Rutledge earlier. I got overwhelmed by reading a book she wrote two years ago that totally changed my life. The book's called The, the Crucifixion, Understanding the Death of Jesus Christ. Don't run out and buy it. It's 900 pages. It's extraordinary. I think Bishop Barron had recommended it in something that he wrote. I ordered it. It came in the mail. It was like this. I went, okay, I'll put that away. I'll read it during Lent. I had no idea who Fleming Rutledge was. I started reading it on Ash Wednesday. I, I got through maybe the first page, and I said, this is like literary gold. Who is this guy? Not a guy. <laughs> Not Catholic. Here's what I'll say about Fleming Rutledge. She's the most manly preacher I've ever read in my life. She's extraordinary, and she's changed the way I do this. I can't do created, captured, rescued, and response tonight. It's too long. I can send you to our website. You can listen to talks. Those of you who, like, have insomnia and you need something to listen to, listen to me. I'll put you to sleep. I'll send you the links. But I do want to talk about rescued because this is, as I'm praying about tonight, and I'm praying about the veil, and I'm asking the Lord how He wants to remove the veil, if we get this… the veil comes down. The, the captured piece is essential. I don't think most of us get that clearly enough. The gospel is just news if the bad news isn't horrific. But the bad news, people, is far worse than our worst nightmare. But we're not going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about what it is that Jesus did for us. And maybe especially for men, this was my sense in thinking about tonight. Here's what I think Jesus wants to do. He wants, he wants to lift up his lordship. 
in front of us as brothers. Because a lot of us, especially men perhaps, if I can speak to you for a moment, this is our image of Jesus. He's kind. He's gentle. He's compassionate. He's merciful. He's loving. And all those things are true, blessed be He. Here's what we don't hear. Jesus is absolutely and utterly unconquerable. He's Lord. And I'll run through the wall for Him. He's not timid. I just saw the movie on Mr. Rogers. It's a great movie. I wouldn't run through a wall for Mr. Rogers as virtuous as the man was, and he was extraordinarily virtuous and a great man, but I wouldn't run through a wall for him. But when I see Jesus as he is, triumphant, risen, having gone to battle for me, you can have everything that I am, Lord. That's what we're going to talk about. I, I subtitled this, God's Shocking and Unexpected Response to Sin. Many of us might know this icon. It's uh, one of the more famous icons of the Trinity. I read once, I don't know where I read it. It might have been a dream because I've never been able to find it since, but it's the most powerful interpretation of this icon I've ever come across. So the figure on the left is the Father. The figure in the center is the Son. The figure on the right is the Holy Spirit. The, the interpretation that I read of the icon went something like this. This is an image of the Trinity discussing what to do after the fall, after the rebellion of Adam and Eve. And the father on the left poses the question that goes something like this. Who will go and get him? The him is Adam and Eve. Who will bring him back? Who will bring him home? And the son in the center has his head tilted towards the father to say, I will. And the spirit has his head down because he knows the cost. The easiest way I know how to break into the kerygma is by asking this question. June 6, 1944. Allies landing at Normandy. Why are they there? When we were dowling the other day, I was talking to one of the history teachers. I said, so imagine we're going to give a freshman history class a quiz, and here's the question. Why are they there? There's the photo, and they got four choices, right? First choice, because the coffee on Champs-Élysées. Oh, second to none. The kid goes back to eighth grade if he answers that, right? <laughs> Option B, the beaches on the west coast of France. Those are really nice. No, right? They're dying to see the Mona Lisa. No, why are they there? They're there to fight. That's why they're there. It's obvious. Here's the problem. Why is he there? People, it's the same answer. He's there to fight. That's what Scripture tells us. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Jesus says, shortly before He enters into His passion, which is sacramentally made present for us in the mystery that we call the Mass, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out. Why? Because I am going to battle with Him. We pray this every morning as priests. And those of you who join us in the Liturgy of the Hours or as deacons, you know this too, huh? The Benedictus. God has come to His people and set them free. He promised He would save us. Note the words from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. This doesn't mean the other political party or like, you know, Ohio State. <laughs> I'm from Michigan. It means the enemy, Satan, hell, death, sin, 
to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death. That's all of us. We're haunted by the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Here's what Jesus, here's how He describes it, perhaps one of His most enigmatic parables. He tells it several times. It's in the Gospels. It's in Matthew and in Mark and in Luke, huh? When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. This is the parable he tells immediately after he drives out a demon, and people are wondering, like, how are you doing this? Pharisees are saying it, you're doing it by the devil. Others are saying he's doing it by the power of God. Jesus says, but when one stronger than he assails him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. Who's the strong man? Satan. What's his palace? This world. Who are his goods? Note this, please. Every buddy. Unless you have been set free. Who's the one who's stronger than him? That would be Jesus. And note the word he uses assails him. In another translation, how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. This is what Jesus has come to do. Why are the allies there? They're there to fight. Why is he there? He's there to fight. If the bishop and I lived in France in 1944 and it's June 7th and we've lost most of our family, we're Our country's been occupied by a tyrannical, demonic dictator. The continent is a total disaster. And the paper boy throws the newspaper in. And he's having a cup of coffee. And I start reading the paper, and I open it up, and he says, hey, what happened yesterday? And I go, oh, looks like the Allies landed. It's going to rain today. Do you think I'd read it like that? Of course you wouldn't read it like that. That's not news that the Allies landed on June 6, 1944. That's extraordinary news. It's life-changing news. It meant someone came to fight for them, to rescue them, to do something for them about somebody who had captivated them in a negative way, who had oppressed them, tyrannized them, killed them, enslaved them. The gospel is better than that, as great as that day was. The incarnation, what we're about to celebrate on the Feast of Christmas, huh? The incarnation is the invasion of one kingdom. That's the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of hell, the kingdom of Satan. This world which was in His grip because we had sold ourselves into slavery to Him unknowingly, God became a man to invade that kingdom by a stronger kingdom, His own kingdom, and He did it in disguise. Because the one who ruled this world would never pick a fight with God because he knows he doesn't have a chance. And so God hides himself as a man to go to war for you and me. Here's how one person put it. Christ didn't come merely to teach a new doctrine about what, how we should behave or to set an example of selfish, selflessness. Christ came above all to perform a deed the destruction of death. Note, it's capital D, because death's a dominion. It's a power, not just something that happens to us, and the establishment of an everlasting kingdom of life. Jesus didn't come to tell stories, although He told them, and He didn't come to do miracles, although He did them. Jesus came to do something about this world, His creation, which was made through Him and for Him which was in the hands of an enemy. That's why he came. Look at him on the screen or in this cross up here on the stage. When we look at Jesus there, does it look like it's happening to him? Or does it look like he's initiating the action? looks like it's happening to him. 
pretty obviously. I mean, he's nailed to a cross, for crying out loud, and he doesn't have a loincloth on. Romans didn't crucify you with clothes on. The whole point of crucifixion is absolute and utter humiliation. To say about the, the thing that's nailed to the cross, this thing isn't even human. And so people were invited. It was part of a game. It was sport. It was entertainment to be there, to mock the person, to taunt the person. They didn't crucify people in a basement. They did it on a major highway so that everybody would see it. And they were all invited to come to it. But note what Jesus says here, huh? The enemy has no power over me. So when you look at Jesus on the cross then, let me ask you a question. Is he the hunted or is he the hunter? Is he a victim or is he the aggressor? Again, it looks pretty obvious. He looks like he's the hunted and it looks like he's the victim. He's not. Jesus is hunting on the cross. Jesus is performing a deed on the cross. It often looks like when people talk about the Lord, it's like, well, He was born. It seems so promising at the beginning. He, he's kind of hidden for 12 years, shows up, then He's hidden for another 18, then He goes out and He does these three years of extraordinary things, miracles, driving out demons, whatever, and then like there was this bizarre ending to His life. But then He rose, and I think everything's somehow okay. It's like, no, the whole point of His coming is that. And that's what's sacramentally made present at every Mass. Anybody know these words? I never heard these words before in my life, before two years ago. I'm sitting in the chapel shortly before Holy Week. I'm reading the Scriptures, just asking the Lord to teach me about what it is He's doing in His passion. And as I'm sitting there, you, know, you, you can hear God's voice in the way that, you know, you hear it just like Addie was talking about. She heard the Lord say that that's not the, the real highlight of the day. The real highlight of the day is you're about to receive me. Similar kind of way. I just heard the Lord say these two words to me. I'm like, ambush predator. What the heck's an ambush predator? Pulled out my phone, Google ambush predator, and I start to laugh. That's an ambush predator. That's an ambush predator. Ambush predators are creatures which lie motionless and still, camouflaged with their environments for one purpose. to attract prey. And when the prey gets close, they pounce. That's who Jesus is. How does He camouflage Himself? Well, from the moment of His sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, here's what happens to him, huh? It's as if his divinity is more, which is already cloaked underneath his humanity, but his divinity is more and more and more and more and more disguised, right? He sweats blood, he's arrested, he's chained. This is God we're talking about. <laughs> he's slapped, he's judged, he's stripped naked, he's scourged almost to the point of death, he's crowned with thorns, and he's finally nailed to a cross. Why? Why? Why is this happening? You can't nail God to a cross unless He wants to be there. You can't buy that nail. It doesn't exist. This is God we're talking about. There's only one way God can get onto a cross. What's the one way? He has to want to be there. Why would He want to be there? Because He's trying to draw somebody close. He's trying to attract the prey. Jesus on the cross is the ambush predator. Now, you might think this is something novel to me. It's not. There's always been three ways to understand the Paschal Mystery what it is that Jesus is doing in His death and His resurrection. Two of them we're pretty familiar with, I think. The third one, maybe not so much. The first is that Jesus on the cross is showing us how much the Father loves us, right? So, God so loved the world that He sent His only begotten Son 
so that we would not perish but find everlasting life. That's true. By all means, that's true, and it moves many of us. But it's not exhaustive, and it doesn't move others of us. A second way to understand what's happening in His passion is Jesus is becoming sin. He's making atonement for us. St. Paul says, God made Him who knew no sin to be sin so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. This is also true. This moves even fewer of us. But it's true, right? But most of us look at Jesus on the cross and we go, uh, I don't think I'm that bad a guy. Like, I don't think you had to do all that for me. I am, and so are you. It just, we just don't know that, right? But it's just true. But it's not complete. Here's the third way, though. Actually, the preferred way, the favorite way of the early church to talk about what God is doing through Jesus on the cross. He's going to war to rescue us. Here's how St. Ephraim, one of the great early writers of the church, put it. It's a long quote. Bear with me, but take a picture of this and go back and pray with it. It's an extraordinary understanding. Here's a man removing the veil of why it is that God is hanging on a cross. Death trampled our Lord underfoot. But He, in His turn, treated death as a high road for His own feet. He submitted to it, enduring it willingly, because by this means, He would be able to destroy death in spite of itself. Death had its own way when our Lord went out from Jerusalem carrying His cross. But when by a loud cry from that cross, He summoned the dead from the underworld, death was powerless to prevent it. Death slew Him by means of the body which He had assumed, but that same body proved to be the weapon with which He conquered death. Concealed beneath the cloak of His manhood, His Godhead engaged death in combat. But in slaying our Lord, death itself was slain. It was able to kill natural human life, but was itself killed by the life that is above the nature of man. Death could not devour our Lord unless He possessed a body. Neither could hell swallow Him up unless He bore our flesh. And so, get a load of this line. He came in search of a chariot in which to ride to the underworld. This chariot was the body which He received from the Virgin. In it, He invaded death's fortress, broke open its strong room, and scattered all its treasure. It's as if the Lord on the cross, it's as if Satan's standing in front of Jesus on the cross. And he's looking at him and he's saying something like this. You know, you're an extraordinary man. I see you do unbelievable miracles, but I've seen miracles before. And you don't sin, but that woman over there, she doesn't sin either. But, you know, in a few minutes, you're mine. And no one can let you out from my grip. And that's exactly what the Lord wants to happen. It's as if He wants to get swallowed by death so that He can explode death from inside. Do you get this? This is not our typical understanding of what it is that's happening in the Passion. Here's the question, why? Why would God do this? Why would the creator of a universe that's 46 billion light years across, that's 46 billion times 5.88 trillion miles across, why would he become a man to go to war to rescue you and me, puny little creatures, even though we're made in his image and likeness? Why would he do this? You know why? Because love does things like that. And God is love. You know why? Because you matter. Not you all. You matter, John. 
You matter. Leslie. You matter. Dan. You're worth the trouble. That's how one philosopher once described what, it, what does it mean to say to somebody that I love you? It means to say, you are worth the trouble. That's what Jesus is saying from the cross to you and me. I don't understand that. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. Just you are worth the trouble. And every single time you step into Mass, you're sacramentally there again at the cross. And Jesus is saying, you matter this much. You're worth this much trouble to the creator of the universe before whom angels bow in awe. That's what's supposed to be going through our minds whenever we go to Mass. What's the result of all this, of all that Jesus has done? I'm going to put this up here just so you can take a picture of it if you want to have it because I'm not going to talk about all these things. But here's what Jesus has done for you and for me as a result of this Paschal mystery. huh? He's destroyed death. It has no power over me anymore. I'm going to die, but it can't hold me. That's extraordinary news, people. I buried my mom, my dad, and my brother in two and a half years. I'm going to see him again, not because everything turns out well, but because God did something about death. That's great news. It's life-changing news, huh? He's transferred us, Paul says. I used to be, it belonged to the kingdom of darkness. I was a slave to the power of sin and death. I could not get out of that on my own. He transferred me. I don't belong to that kingdom anymore. I belong to the kingdom of light, God's beloved Son. That's what Paul says in Colossians 1. He's recreated us. The most profound thing about the Christian life, perhaps, that we can say is this. You can change. There are people who walked into this room tonight who are struggling with things that they can't stand struggling with. It might be an addiction to something. It might be anxiety about something. It might be fear about something. Here's what the Lord says right now to you and me. You can change, or rather, I can change you right now. Not by your trying harder, just by surrendering. That's what God does. He recreates. He's rendered sin impotent. This is rather sobering news, actually, but I don't have to sin anymore. Neither do you. I do all the time because I have memories and instincts and habits, but I don't have to. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me and in you if you've been baptized. Sin, capital S, sin, as a dominion, is impotent with you and me. I can live a new life. I can live a life of freedom. He has humiliated the enemy. He's crushed Satan's head. He's stripped him of his power. Is he still prowling around this world? You better believe it. But it's like the end, that, that in-between time between D-Day and V-E Day, right? The moment the Allies land on June 6, 1944, the war is over in Europe, and everybody knows it. But it's a year between that and V-E Day, and we're living in something like that right now. He's prowling like crazy, but the king's coming back. And Satan cowers in fear at the name of Jesus. There is no rivalry between the two of them. This isn't a Marvel comic story. He's God. He's a creature. And he's given you and me authority over him. And he sent you and me on mission to get his world back. This is what Jesus tells us, huh? I've given you authority to tread upon serpents. That's an image of the devil. And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. This doesn't mean, like, I'm going to go walk into a propeller. Don't be stupid, right? It means he's equipped us to do something in this world, not just to go, cool, I know Jesus now. I can't wait for him to get, out of, to get me out of here. No, no, no. He's, he's entrusted responsibilities to us. Jesus says to Peter, huh? You are rock, upon you I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't think we understand this verse very well. We usually mean it or think it means something like, 
well, it's bad, but, you know, Jesus said no matter how bad it gets, like, hell's not going to prevail upon the church. That's not what he says. He says the gates of hell will not prevail. Who's ever been attacked by a gate? Gates are defensive tactics. What Jesus is saying is hell has no chance. Why? Because I have risen and I have given you authority because I've put my spirit in you which raised me from the dead and he's in you now to do something which isn't just so that you can know me. That's a great thing, but he's got more work for us to do. So he tells us, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always. Don't ever be afraid to the end of the age. So what does he want? That's what he's done. What's he want? We'll fly through this. Know these words? Ite misa est, huh? Some of us are old enough to remember those, the conclusion of the Mass. You know what they mean? That's the best translation I know of, of Ite misa est. She sent. Who's the she? The church. Who's the church? You. What are you sent to do? That's what he wants. He wants his world back. <laughs> and he wants you and me to be instruments by which it can happen. How do we do that? First of all, it's by understanding this is our mission. To be a Christian, N.T. Wright, another great modern Pauline scholar, says it's not about inner self discovery and private devotion, it's about rescue and public witness. Here's how a friend of mine puts it. Rescued people, rescue people. Once you've encountered God, once you've come to experience what it is that Jesus has done for us, that I used to be a slave and I'm not a slave anymore, that I used to be bound by the fear of death and I'm not bound by the fear of death anymore. Once you meet the creator of the universe and you realize that there's only two kinds of people in the world, there's either people who know Him well, there's people who don't, and you know that to not know Him is to be in blindness and to be in slavery, then you do everything you can to rescue them because you were once as they were, and I was once as they are. Jesus says that that's what you and I are. We're lamps. That's the image that He uses when He uses this or says this passage in the Gospel of Matthew. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a bushel basket. The lamp he's talking about there is a hand lamp, like that little one there from Roman times. See the little hook at the end of it? That's for a finger. Why don't you light a lamp and put it underneath a basket? Because it's stupid. That's why. <laughs> Nobody would do that. It makes no sense. What Jesus is saying is, you're the lamp. Don't hide his light. And by using the image of a hand lamp, here's what he's telling us. It's as if he wants to pick you and me up every single morning when we wake up. Or rather, as we're lying in bed, we can see ourselves as that lamp and we say to the Lord, Lord, here I am. You have lit me on fire with your love and your mercy and your spirit. Pick me up and put me wherever you want to put me today. Put me on a stand in the house, that's his world, so that people who are blind can see, and people who are hopeless can find hope, and people who are stuck can get free. Use me somehow, puny, fragile, sinful me, to help others see you. So how can we help remove the veil? Because I think we can. Because I think a lot of people don't see the clarity of what it is that's happening at Mass because of us. So I think there's some things we can do. First, know the story. That's the gospel. The gospel's power. It overwhelms people. So I can tell the story. It's not enough to know it. You've got to share it. 
I had an image one time of standing in line to be judged by the Lord, and there's people behind me, and we're about to go forward. And there were people that I never talked to about the gospel. And as I'm waiting to look at the, the Lord or meet the Lord, they kind of walked up to me and they're tapping on the, me on the shoulder and they're saying, you knew about this and you didn't say anything? You never told me about any of this? How could you have never told me about this? To see him now in his majesty. So tell the story. Third, go. And change the world. The church is the only organization that I know of that exists for the sake of those who do not belong to it. Did you get that? We exist for the sake of those who do not belong to the church. We exist until the Lord comes back to do mission because the world is in bondage to a tyrant who is so much worse than we can understand. And God wants to use you and me to change that world. He wants you and me, whether we're healthcare professionals, attorneys, judges, stay-at-home dads, stay-at-home moms, pastors, nurses, teachers, coaches. He wants to use you as an instrument in his hands to be a means by which whatever it is that you do in your daily life, you will do in such a way as to help recreate it and restore it and remake it according to the plan that God the Father has for it. That's our task. That's especially the lay vocation's task. That's what it means to sanctify the world. He wants to use you to put it all back together or to help until he comes back and he does it himself. We can't hide as Christians. We're not supposed to be ghettos. It's going to get hard, people. It's going to get very hard. And the temptation will be to be cowardly. But once you encounter Jesus and you know who he is and you know he's Lord and you know he's triumphant and you know he is not anxious and he has no rival and he's not nervous, we won't be cowardly. He wants to start right here with those of you. He wants the city, this diocese back. What's that mean? Wherever you go to work on Monday, ask the Lord, Lord, how can I transform this place to be more in keeping with how you made it to be? Whether it's a hospital or a school or a daycare clinic, what can we do? And if you haven't put out your manger yet, when we do so, as you place that little thing underneath the tree or on a mantle or wherever you put it, ask the Lord, Lord, help me to know this Christmas in a way like I've never known before. Why you're there. Why you came. And how much I matter to you. Help me to know in a way that only you can enable me to know that I'm worth the trouble. And when we know that and we come to Mass, the veil is removed. So let's watch it again. <laughs>